everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Anne Inoshita, and as you know, I teach at Leeward Community College. I teach English classes here, and I'm so happy to bring a bunch of uh, Renchi poets <laughs> here, and we're going to read from our, our book, uh, no, excuse me, <laughs> What We Must Remember, um, and I'll have everyone introduce themselves. Aloha, I am Christy Passion. I'm the first person to write the link of poetry, and you'll see that as we come out. I am actually a critical care nurse at the Queens Medical Center. I work, at, my title is crisis nurse or rapid responder. If you're in massive trouble, meaning you have a heart attack, you can't breathe, you're in a trauma, you're going to see me. So hopefully I don't see you outside of this area, not at Queens anyway. I've uh, been writing with them for the past, we just were discussing this almost 10 years now. We're getting close to that. Uh, this is actually our second book of poetry we wrote together, uh, What We Must Remember, and I have a singular volume that came out kind of close to it, side by side, still out of place. So I look forward to sharing what I, what I wrote and hearing your questions today. I'm Juliet Escono. That's the name I write under, but every, most everybody know um, they, you know me as Juliet Lee. I used to work here and retired two years ago. And um, um, I've been flying free since then. <laughs> but um, I'm very happy to be here. I have many uh, fond memories of Leeward Community College. And I see some of my students and my old colleagues. And I'm so happy everybody's here. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Jean Toyama, and uh, before I retired, I used to teach French literature and uh, language at Uni University of Hawaii at Manoa. I've been retired for a long time, and I can't believe it, because I'm busier than ever. And one of the reasons I'm busier than ever is I got connected with these women, because in 2010, we published our first book, no choice but to follow. And since then, we've been known as the Renshi poets. Now, just to refresh your memory as to what Renshi is, how many of you know what language it comes from? Renshi. Japanese. Huh? Japanese for collaborative poetry or linked poetry. And here we use it to mean linked poetry, but we have been collaborating very well and for a long time. And so what is linked? I just imagined this yesterday, and I was so excited when I thought, OK, linked. And this is what our poems do. Our poems link to each other. And how do they link? The last line of the preceding person becomes the first line or the title of the next person. So all of our poems become unique and individual and yet become a part of a whole. So in, after we had done the 2010, in 2011, people asked us, well, what are you going to do next? And we didn't know what to do. But Juliet said, well, you know, this year, 2011, is the 80th anniversary of the Massey case, and neither of us three wanted to look dumb. So we said, oh, is that so? But we didn't really know anything about it. And since then, we had to learn by reading books and doing research, as you do here at Leeward. Now, the Massey case, we call it the Massey Kahahawai case. And you will understand why we do that in our book. This book is the result of that first idea of uh, doing a linked poem based on historical facts. So everything here is based on actual events, except the imaginative part that we provided to link the story together. Now, in uh, 1931, actually five days from now, on September 12th, a woman named Thalia Massey, who was the wife of a naval officer, 
accused five local men of having raped her. Now, this caused an uproar, but the men were brought to trial. And in spite of conflicting facts, we didn't have the word factoids at that time, in spite of conflicting facts and testimony that did not come together, they were put on trial. But after 97 votes, the jury could not come to a decision. So it was a mistrial. The five men were set free on bail. But during that time, one man, Horace Ida, was kidnapped, beaten, and almost thrown off the poly. Unfortunately, another man, Joseph Kahavai, was kidnapped on January 8th and murdered. Five, four people were caught red-handed. The body was in the car. They were headed for the blowhole to get rid of the evidence. There was no way to avoid a trial. So they were put to trial, but not for murder, for manslaughter. They were all found guilty, received the obligatory 10-year sentence of hard labor. After they were sentenced, they met in the governor's office. They sat there for one hour. Some say they were drinking champagne because Governor Lawrence McCulley Judd commuted their sentence and they were set free, and they left the islands. Now, these are the facts of the story that impassioned us in 2011. We wrote the links, and then we dropped it. And if you want to, why, you know, want to know why, you can ask us afterwards. But right now, we'll be reading two complete series of links for you. Reading assignment, standards honor killing. I don't wanna read this story. Don't wanna know their names, imagine their faces. I catch my breath as the words surface. Tin can alley, bare feet football, brown skin boys wearing white silk shirts. See them behind the wheel, immortal for the night. Hear the ease in their laughter, stronger than daylight and the poor too close to home. It is my father's stories of his Hawaii. There were few comforts, but there were dances at the Alawai Club, violets in Kalihi, Stubo for 25 cents. There were beatings, Japs, Howleys, Blalas, and curfew. Dirty cops way too willing. Rats that climbed up, tin gutters. Girls with nice legs who gave it up, easy. And if you were lucky, real lucky, a job at the shipyard was different back then, Chris. No can believe was so hard. But we work, go drink, talk story, forget for a little while. This is not Michener's Hawaii. I skip to the end where she commits suicide and like a child burning ants, feel a false sense of power. The end gathers me up for the journey back. This story is the unwanted family heirloom, the ugly vase, the chipped china, the bastard child everyone whispers about, but no one calls by name. One Call, Sunday, September 13, 1931. Saturday night wasn't busy in the Kapiolani building, so no one from the Honolulu police could predict an early morning phone call that changed Hawaii forever. Before the call came, Agnes Peoples walked into the building at 12.45 a.m. Agnes said her husband was driving when they encountered a car filled with men where King and Liliha intersect. Although the cars didn't hit, Agnes and a man from the other car fought, resulting in blood seeping from her ear. She remembered the car's license number, 58-985, and Officer Cecil Ricard recorded her statement. The phone rings at 1.47 a.m. 
So Captain Hans Kashiwabara picks up. Tommy Massey reports an assault and wants the police to visit his house. The captain calls Detective John Jardine. Then Jardine contacts Ricard, who instructs police to drive to the Massey home. Detective Harbottle, Detective Furtottle, and Officer Simerson listen as Thalia Ma Massey speaks. She was at the Alawai Inn and went for a walk at about midnight when a car filled with four or five Hawaiians came by. She was forced into the car and punched. They drove her to a secluded area, removed her from the car to the bushes, and raped her six or seven times. They raped her, she alleged, six or seven times in her beautiful green dress. I was that green dress. Now I am the ghost of the green dress. These days I float ethereally from where the Alawai Inn stood down to John Ina Road near Fort Derusi, where Mrs. George Goez, Alice Araki, and Eugenio Batang Bacal testified they saw me pass by, which places me in the area that night. I am the ghost of the green dress Thalia wore when she said she was abducted by five Hawaiians and brought to a place dark, isolated, desolate in Ala Moana, known as Beach Road, where only a few small fishing boats creaked in darkness and dogs whined, their cries coming from the old animal quarantine station. I am the ghost of the dress that continues to weave in and out of the psyche of Hawaii's people. Then again, that's another story. I am the ghost of the green dress Iridescent as the ocean when in the limu's green bloom, a green that accentuated the color of her fair skin, her light soulful eyes, rose pink lips, and fine brown hair. To have seen her, you would have been hard pressed to say she was pretty, but unconventionally attractive, she was taller than most women in the islands and had a kind of lugubrious cheekness made of old money and deep unhappiness as she walked away from the inn in an inebriated sway. In the car where she said she was raped, I don't remember if I were lifted gently from her legs or shoved up to her waist with trembling hands or pressed by desire against the heaving want and weight of desperate men. I don't remember if they nestled their need into my neckline as they drooled into her cleavage, if indeed they even did. After whatever happened, once at home, I was taken off and hung like a scarecrow in her bedroom. She called the police to say she had been beaten and raped, and the detectives came to take her statement. But Detective Bill Furtado and his partner George Harbottle did not inspect me much, as I swayed in winds from the valley. Only later was I scrutinized, whereupon they found a tiny blood spot and bit of soil, nothing more. I remained green, was clean. I don't know when it happened. This part folded into my imagination. But some months later, if ever, I was stripped from the hanger and stomped on in anger. Torn from across the bodice, I was dragged out, taken to the backyard where I was hung and set on fire, burned in effigy. Burned in effigy. It ain't in effigy I want to burn them, but in the flesh, real bones covered in dark skins. The papers didn't give her name, just said a beautiful young woman, cultured and of gentle bearing. For sure she was white and raped. We wouldn't stand for that where I come from. That's what my buddy said. Maybe he's right. My own blood boiled, seeing them black boys right on top. On top, mind you, of white girls. Even on surfboards, it still ain't right. Skin on skin. On the beach, they're laughing, strumming ukulele, singing, smiling. Oh, yes, smiling. And then those colored girls here don't act polite. You say hello. They look right through you like you're not even there. At home, no girl treated me that way. This ain't no dreamy Hawaii. 
No joy zone. The movies lie. Things ain't right here. Coloreds don't know their place. We heard the Admiral call them rapists, sordid people, brutes, and hoodlums. Two of them are even from that orange race, the one they say we're going to fight one day. My buddy told me I just had no guts because I didn't want to go down to the jail to burn them. Then he shoves the paper in my face. Read those names. Ida, Chang, Kahahavai, Takai, Ahakuelo. What are they? Not American. What are they? I said nothing the night they came, the first night gone. Put away the stew warming on the stove, closed the lights, closed my eyes to his lean arms, his father's arms, locked in cuffs, folded down into the police car, eyes straight ahead, a man, my son, a man. The fourth night, the fifth night, I said nothing, kept it in my mouth, kept it in my skull, the tentacled fear reaching down, choking out the air. There is so little air for mothers without sons, without money. Hammers to a shell, hammers to my spine, the newspapers, howly women who float above. What are they? Roots to a lie. What are they? Ladders to hell. I sweep the porch slow as the week passes, as the radio jabbers, as the walls get closer, there's still enough room in the day to boil potatoes, hang clothes on the line, room in the day to visit my son, to ask him what all mothers ask, what all helpless mothers ask. Do you have enough to eat? The truth. Each night is a stone, each day bitter water. At the bus stop, I light a cigarette with nothing left to do but wait. Waiting for the newspapers. In 1931, the Hawaii Hochi and Nipu Jiji had many readers and included sections in English for Japanese who were second generation in Hawaii. You and read the Hochi. They came up with some good questions. No makes sense, yeah? How come at plenty witness who saw all the suspects far away from the crime scene when the rape happened? No makes sense. No more evidence that the lady was in their car and her dress stay in good condition. Funny kind. Even had one howly guy walking behind her at the time of the rape. They no more any other suspects, cause sound like these guys never do nothing. Advertiser editorials claim that Hawaii was unsafe for women. Both the Advertiser and the Star Bulletin published articles that assumed all suspects were guilty. Thalia's name was missing from the Advertiser and Star Bulletin for months but photos with names and addresses of all suspects were included in the papers. Although the trial did not start, there already was a difference in what people in Hawaii thought of this case based on race. Based on race. Not long ago, my friend, my neighbor friend said, we the underdogs, we don't have a chance. Look the Fukunaga boy, in no time they hang him. Remembering this, my heart gave way in anguish when they took my son away. The middle of the night, accused. I didn't want to show my face, so ashamed. I didn't want to go out of my small home in Hell's Half Acre. Scared, too, for I saw everything in our outside world as too big, white. For I had forgotten we breathed like them eat like them, dream like them. The only difference, we a different color, not white. Once I had big dreams. I thought perhaps my children would someday break the land covenants, go to college. I broke my back, my fingers to raise my children right. Even forgot those in Japan, my family's history beginning here and now turned nightmare. My horse is in jail with the other boys, accused not only by the white woman, but by my eyes of shame. What did the mothers do wrong? I have to keep reminding myself, nothing. Our boys, they're good men, 
but now they are in jail, right, put there without charges. Without charges, they wait in jail, these no names, crushing knuckles against the concrete wall, wondering how it happened. In her house in Maanoa, Thalia Fortescue Massey engraves her father's name, Granville, into his cousin's name, Theodore Roosevelt. Then she melds her grandfather's cousin's name, Alexander Graham Bell, into the armor of her story. Her allies amass their titles and weight. Rear Admiral Yates Sterling Jr., Commandant of the U.S. Navy, enlists his friend, Walter F. Dillingham, Baron of Hawaii's industry. In response, a counterbalance develops. A mother calls a princess, Abigail Kawananakoa, who calls a heavyweight, William H. Heen, born of Hawaiian and Chinese parents, educated at Hastings Law School, first non holy judge appointed to the First Circuit Court since resigned, leader of the Democratic Party. To his team, he adds a crackerjack Howley lawyer from Vicksburg, Mississippi, William Buckner Pittman, descendant of Francis Scott Key. With the star-spangled banner on his side, Robert Murakami, graduate of Chicago, University of Chicago Law School, joins to even out the battle. So that's the first two links, or complete links. And there are more to come to tell the whole story, but we have limited time. So we um, ask you if you have any questions to ask us about the process, the history, if we can answer that, and how we got to do this project that in a way has changed our lives. You can clap too. <laughs> Shame. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Um, Aloha, first of all, I just want to say mahalo nui to all of you. I just started rereading the honor killing. Oh, uh -huh. today. Um, really was excited to hear your voices. Uh, my question is have you, have any of you spoken to the descendants of, of those men mm -hmm. and, and what was it like to talk to their own? It was wonderful. A lot of them came to our reading at um, Ahapuni. Is that what it's called now? Yeah. Namea. Namea. The old Namea. In yeah. yeah. And we were so surprised. Uh, uh, I had chicken skin when I f found out that they were there. A, a whole slew, all these handsome young men and beautiful women. And um, I myself was relieved that our endeavoring on this project did not cause more hurt or bring up memories that they may have wanted to, to lie low. As for the other members of the other four men, um, we were just wondering whether... Yeah, we it, never heard from We them. never heard from them. There's only one family member. Um, ben Ahokuelo went on to have his own family. Uh, Joseph Kahahobai, which is the family members that uh, we had met the Kahawai mm -hmm. family. Uh, he, uh, he was obvious. He was the one that was murdered. He did not have children of his own. Um, but uh, nephews, the family went on. It is their descendants we met. Not the Ahokuala family, and very little is known of the other men, Takai, Ida, mm -hmm. and Chang. Okay. Uh, this case, even though they were innocent of the crimes, scarred them. And many of them have just slipped into obscurity. The only person that spoke up about the case was Ahokuala. Been and many years later in the 1960s, so that uh, just to give background to that, yeah, the Kahahabai family was very gracious. Yes, very gracious. Yeah. And actually, I told you that we had started in um, 2011. After we wrote for what eight months, we dropped it because we felt 
but we don't want to. It was hard. And then we only started again because we were given in indications from family members that it would be all right. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know whether I'm using the right words by saying it would be all right, but they wouldn't oppose it. There, there's, oh. go ahead, Julia. Oh. Um, there, there's two trains of thought when we were writing this. The one is because the majority of our group here didn't know the case. And I'm not sure if you guys grew up knowing this case. You guys, did you guys know about this case? Okay, because I didn't. Even though we're, I was supposed to have learned about it in the eighth grade as dictated by some school requirement, it was not taught to us. Um, so I like, felt outrage when I first read this story. And you can't read it without feeling outrage. Uh, and I wanted very much to tell it so people knew it, you know, so that this man didn't die in vain. And just, just his life had no meaning. So you have this one side of us that feels very much like we need to put this story out there for the people who didn't hear it, uh, to present it in a way that shows the human aspects of what's going on. When you read about this case, it's mostly through court trial doctrine, academic papers, dissertations, but it's not from the human perspective. It's, uh, it's written in a very academic, very clean way almost. Um, and then the opposing side, which is, will this cause hurt to the people who are closest to this family? So what Jean said, when there was some indication that it may be good, it, less, it took a little bit of a weight off of us that we weren't doing damage by doing this project. Um, well, for me also, I guess for everybody, uh, the temper of the times, we dropped it, but then we resurrected the idea after a lot of things were happening in the country. Um, so uh, I think that sort of spurred us in, in some way. Don't you yeah. think so? It kind of... But it, but it wasn't because we like wanted... For good, yeah, yeah, it wasn't right. because of that, but it was also we wanted... We saw parallels, perhaps, yeah. or some, some things... Anyway, the temper of the times, you, you can say. And we're speaking specifically about the Ferguson case, yes. yeah. the Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. when all of these uh, things, things coming started up. coming up in our country concerning race, mm -hmm. concerning economic strata. Uh, it was like, this book has it all. You know, they, I mean, they, this, this story, story is all of that. So it yeah. propelled us, like, pick it back up and maybe let's see how we can put this forward. Yeah. Personally, I didn't want to continue because I wanted to foment rage. Because the, the um, reaction of anger and rage and or stuffing um, hard feelings can come back and explode. But I was searching for some way to understand, is there a way to avoid the cycle of violence? Is there a way to, I guess, some people don't like it when they say, oh, yeah, the Japanese say, korai te, korai te, forgive. Did, and some people don't it, yeah. like it to, uh, if you do that. Yeah. But that was where I was coming from. Let's understand it so we can fix it. Right. And when we say what we must remember, it doesn't mean that we have to um, you know, bring back the case in such a way that um, it's also a healing process, to, I, I think for us to understand that we can progress and not be stuck in this kind of situations anymore. And we should try to disseminate it to the rest of the country too, because I think we have something really different here, um, better than any place else, I think. But, yes? Since the launch of this book, what was the feedback, or what is the feedback that you've been receiving from the readers, from you know our, our local community. Buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. Did you want to ask one more? Is there any negative? What? Oh, you, no. Negative. Oh, no, 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 not at all. No, no. We did an interesting thing last uh, week. We did a Skype thing with a class in UC Santa Cruz. It was interesting to see that the students didn't make the connection with Ferguson. Did mm -hmm. I get that correct? Mm -hmm. They didn't seem to see see that what our story was somehow connected with what was happening. No, I, I think they did. 
They did. Okay. I think they did. Glad. I'm I glad think they did. Hear that. But we're but we were coming actually from such a strong local perspective mm -hmm. that they had a different. Uh, I want to say a different take, but maybe what they pinpointed on might have been different. I but it, it's been positive though. Yeah. 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 We haven't had uh, no negative. No. If you read this book, it's not just the poetry. You're going to read our commentary in the back, and in the commentary, you'll get to understand our psyche while writing it. And it was a very hard process because, you know, we're reading about a story that cannot be undone. It's a horrific injustice. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we have to kind of walk around in there and try to understand the, the people that were of that time and what they were thinking. So I think when you read those pieces, uh, if there was any inclination that we're just trying to aggrandize an episode in the history just for our personal benefit it kind of squashes that yeah and the commentary uh, we wrote it in the summer of 2016 where um as you remember last year <laughs> summer of last year it was such a political time you know mm -hmm. and i think uh, one of the reactions we get a lot after we read this and when people read the book is like it, it's a it's hard to like people notice that it's 2017 you know and a lot of the issues that are currently out there it's the same issues that are in this mm -hmm. book so it's kind of surprising where you know we go to the 30s and it's like the same issues we're encountering in 2017 yeah, yeah. so yeah. it's just yeah mm -hmm. oh, amazing incipient racism mm -hmm. uh, one of the things i really learned uh, on a personal basis is i was in high school when Hawaii was trying to become a state, and we sh we got we got so angry when Alaska became a state before we did. It became the 59th state because we thought that we were next in line, and I couldn't understand how come the people on the mainland don't want us to be a state, you know? And then I read this, all the history behind this book. There was so much negative publicity going on about Hawaii. And the racism in Hawaii by us being racist and how we weren't good people in Hawaii, that it was ingrained in the mentality of the people, even in Congress in the 1960s when they were considering us for, for statehood because they couldn't think that we were any different. Mm -hmm. What was very, um, what came out for me is that I really have to be honest with myself about my own racism if I you know I mean it's hard to admit sometimes how we treat others um, and so in my reflections um, um, I I didn't really come out and say it but I know that sometimes I struggled with it so it was it was hard and a lot of times you know we take for granted because Hawaii is such a progressive place you know mm -hmm. you forget right because mm -hmm. you take it for granted that you know, we, we look at each other as people, right? Mm -hmm. Until, you know, you hear things or you hear stories about what happens in other areas, you know, and then it just kind of makes you appreciate how special um, Hawaii is, you know. Um, yeah. Thank you. And, um, um, I really enjoyed that piece where it was the dress that was speaking, how powerful that was. I just wonder, I haven't read the book, but um, do you have a section where Kaha Hawaii is speaking or his mm -hmm. voice comes out? You know, um, um, Jean, has Jean well, I don't think, Jean, there's a poem when Kaha Hawaii, she wrote it in the tone, I don't want to speak for her, of him fading though. It's not a reflection of his thoughts or or any long-term thing. And the, one of the things we discussed after we wrote this is we stayed far away from the men. Um, and, and their thought processes. I, you, you'll see us pick up a, I spoke for Thadia Massey, or there's one about Tommy Massey. Mm -hmm. We, or I did, I, I'll take that. The men in this case were so wronged, so horrifically wronged, that I didn't, I felt I couldn't go there and possibly put words in their mouth or even imagine it that could possibly wrong them again. So it is a shortcoming mm -hmm. that we talked about afterwards. Like some of the main characters, we were like, oh, you know, how do we even approach that? We, we hit it from different angles. None of this was plotted out. So um, yeah. there, it wasn't going, okay, we didn't I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about Thalia and the, the Admiral, and these are the characters going to talk about it. 
Anne's going to take over these certain people's. No. It was not at all. It's completely Nothing. organic. Yeah. Where I wrote a poem, Anne sees the last line and goes, oh, this triggers me to think about this, and she's now writing. Hand it off to Juliet. Oh, she thinks, oh, this reminds her of this person and, and an event, and she's going on. It's chronological, but it's not plotted out. So there are areas that are not yeah. cohesive. Yes. Yeah. The, the question you asked about any of the boys' voices, the only thing that I dared to do is to imagine what someone would say to himself or herself at the moment of dying. So I, I did the, the moment when Joseph Kahawai was dying, when he says, Mama, I don't want to die. And um, that was a hard poem for me to write, but I, I couldn't ignore his murder and that was the moment so it, it just came and Ju <laughs> Christy told me that somebody told her that was his favorite poem boy that made my day <laughs> we had uh, another reading for a book club and someone had a request yes, that did. <laughs> yeah. so people pick up on their favorites and yeah. yeah and I think we all have our different favorite poems yeah. also It was an interesting experience. Um, well done. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, and I did take Massey and Thalia in one of my poems. And the reason I did that, because I wanted to show their character, how, how, how maybe they had lied and cheated, tried to cheat the system or whatever, but to show a kind of the more negative sides of these these people. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I did enter, try to enter their voices. But if you read the commentary, it also shows you our writing processes, which some of you as teachers would find it interesting as to what, you know, what we were going through, how we wrote or took out stuff and, yeah. Um, and for the writing process, I noticed well, for my process, it, it was a case where I didn't want to, because like I, I read Stannard's book, Honor Killing, and I, I mean, as a person who's, uh, who, if I lived at the time, you know, I would probably <laughs> be someone that they would consider as a human, you know, so it was, it was hard to read. Um, but I tried to be as fair as possible and then just try to, bring these characters to life based on who they were and just let what they what their actions speak for themselves, you know? But it was it was hard. It was just I think it was exhausting for all yeah, of it us. Was right, right. Yeah. It was just a lot of emotion. At the end it was like oh, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> yeah, we, we all came together almost like, shall we stop? stop. <laughs> it, it was so it was so um, natural for us to come together and say, oh God, let's stop. And we said, okay, okay. <laughs> We're happy when that happened. <laughs> oh, I find that so interesting, but when some of your other oh, more yeah. personal work about your own lives and experiences, and to hear that the experiences of somebody else could, you know, trigger that kind of emotional response. Oh, yeah. Nothing to do with your own life, but yeah, yeah. I'm sure there were some personal connections and parallels. Yeah. It was interesting. I think we're, because we're trying to put ourselves into the people that we're trying to give voice to. And They're even with, yeah, yeah, even if it's unconscious, it does fatigue you. And it, it takes study too. I had to study. Oh, yeah, we had to study a lot. I mean, the books we read a lot. Um, so. Any questions from the students? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. She has a question. Um, did you folks go to um, Joseph Kahawai's grief site? Yes. And if so, what was that like for you? Oh, for me, well, it says killed, yeah. you know. Um, and it was, when I went to see it, it was actually a long time ago um, because I used to live in Kalihi, and it was, it was overgrown. It was, you know, it was just... It was just a mess there, and it was sort of lopsided. It wasn't, um, you know, nobody was taking care of it. 
now, of course, it's really nice. But um, yeah, I mean, it was at the time I was young, and I didn't. I mean, I wasn't doing this poetry thing, so it, you know, didn't have that emotional depth. But I'm. Funny thing, I didn't even think of going now, you know, because I, it might be too <laughs> emotional. I don't know. I think uh, Christy, you on, went, right? You went, Christy. Um, yeah, but um, this, I think this, how we're writing with this, like getting back to yours and maybe answering some of that, is that there's a conscientiousness in writing this. This is not just my feeling. My crazy uncle I'm writing about. It's <laughs> it's it's a huge miscarriage of justice mm-hmm. and I'm trying to put it out there and there's this sense of responsibility in mm-hmm. writing it and and it it is hard because you, you wanna get it right. You know, even though a lot of the poems, like I said, are perspective poems. We're talking about the people, but the process of like when we talked about possibly publishing this Initially, I was very against it. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is not good enough. Mm-hmm. We got to rewrite everything. I, no, you know, because I didn't want to put it out there and be like, it less than, like, yeah, just less than. And I'm not even sure if this is it, mm-hmm. but that there was a reason that we went to a historian, John Rosen, said, write the intro so that people understand the backstory when they get to the poems. And the reason why we put in the commentary so you could really go through the process with us that when we're hitting this poem, what are we thinking and what are we trying to include in all of these these lines? There is that strong sense for me that we just, we got to get it right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have a question on your research process. So mm-hmm. when you researched local, um, you know, facts here, did you compare it with, I'm sure you did with, written things on the mainland. How did you navigate through that and the different perspectives? What, what do you mean? Like, like the news on the mainland. Oh, oh yeah. And then local. Was there any difference? The, um, we didn't go through, I, I didn't go through old new pa- newspapers of the mainland. I mean, they're there it, and it's it's quite... Is, um, is that what you're... Old newspapers from, during the time. From then compared to like oh, the Hochi oh, and... But, yeah. yeah. But we, standard... Yeah, sorry, we used more Stannard's book and then Kobe Bryant's book and then the Minnesota, for me, the Minnesota Law Doctrines. These are much more academic papers that are like factual. Da, 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 da. Versus... Uh, Actual, yeah. What do you but first... What, uh, you, what, te- what did Steve Original, original, original uh, yeah, yeah. You know. But uh, yeah. Stannard does give a pretty good overview of the headlines that were going to the United States. And so you get a you get an, uh, a a good taste of what uh, America was thinking about Hawaii, and that this was one of the hottest story through that whole year, and it was competing with the the kidnapping of um, that baby, the Lindenberg baby, the Linden, Lindenberg baby. Mm-hmm. You know, it was the number two story or the number one story. First of all, mahalo for being here. Um, brilliant work. Um, and I, I'm very curious about the relationship between the four of you. Like, first of all, how did this even start? And and then how did how has your relationship with each other grown as through the projects that you've had? Over 30 years ago, I participated in one of the first Renshis worldwide because the Japanese poet Oka Makoto was trying to promote Japanese uh, Renshi. He went all over Europe. He came here, and Win Tech Lum and I participated in that. And when um, Bamboo Ridge had their 30th anniversary, he thought, oh, well, we should do a Renshi for the whole year, post a poem every month by each po- poet, four different poets for four different months. That's about 48 poems, poems for the whole year. And he said, he asked all the people at Bamboo Ridge, and nobody said yes. And then he said, he, I wasn't in the group. He said, Gene will do it. I, you know that kid on that uh, breakfast uh, commercial? Mikey will, Mikey do, will it. do it. <laughs> so he asked me, Gene, will you do it? I said, OK. <laughs> and she, she was of the Bamboo Ridge people. She was the only one who said, OK. And nobody else said, OK. But these two, these brave hearts, 
I know we belong together because these guys have no fear. <laughs> you know? And we've been together since then. Yeah. We've traveled together. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, we've eaten yeah. together. We've done everything together. <laughs> yeah, we've traveled quite, quite a, a bit together. together. Yeah. 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 We've been together since 2008. Yeah. yeah. The first, yeah. And we yeah. didn't even, I didn't even meet we didn't. them until we were on the stage giving our first reading at the Book and Music Festival in, in 2008. 2008. We only knew each other online for the yeah. first six months of our project. Yeah. We didn't even talk on the phone. Yeah, we didn't know. How, we didn't, what, we don't, I didn't know what Christy looked like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Looked like. But yeah. I would post a poem on, on the internet. Then... Who was the next person? I was the last. Christine. Yeah. Christine. No, I'm last. No, you're last. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I it's reversed. Yeah, yeah for <laughs> reversed. Oh, we reversed it. So week one, week two, week three, week four, then one, two, four. For the whole year. For the whole year. And in, it was in May. Yeah. We said, we oh, finally. do a reading. Yeah. And we finally met. Yeah. No rehearsal. We walked on stage. And boy, did you get chicken skin. Yeah. 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 And we knew we belonged. <laughs> Thanks for the question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Is yes. There, is yes. 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 I, um, I had I had studied this case in my junior year of high school. Uh -huh. okay. Oh, my, what school? I studied class. Oh. And when it, when we were talking about it in class about how you guys were going to come. I was thinking back to my class. I actually went to go visit my high school teacher who taught me that case. And she was telling me more about it, more, you know, going more into detail. And to be able to come here and listen to a different take, a different way of, of hearing it, I, I kind of, I really appreciate that because it gives me more intel about it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How many of you have, um, in high school, learned about it or? Oh, okay. Pretty cool. How many of you wished you had learned about it earlier? <laughs> yeah. I think we need, we need this in the classroom. <laughs> yeah. But, anyway. It explains a lot of our hidden emotions our yeah. buried emotions, mm -hmm. things that we haven't really acknowledged or understood. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we acknowledge these emotions and understand the source, that can help us cope with what, what we face every day. And you know, it's, it means letting go of some things too, you know. If you understand the history, etc., you can let go of things that not let it fester in you. So. Well, was, was there a question? I'm sorry. I thought it was oh. it, um, So when we talk to our students about race, mm -hmm. ethnicity, bias, mm -hmm. what would you suggest? Because as I'm rereading Stannard's book, mm -hmm. I feel the rage all over again. And, mm -hmm. and I'm a professor. <laughs> <laughs> what do I tell my students when they're reading stuff like this and they feel enraged? Or what would you suggest? Because you mentioned um, not writing this or reading about it to audiences to stir up rage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do we tell our young people about what they're going to feel when they read it? Good. Standard book is impossible to read without rage, I think. Mm -hmm. I think, and this is not to prop up this book, but honestly, when you, if you, attacking it by trying to embody the person perhaps of somebody that's so not like you, uh, maybe the perpetrator of a crime, um, Dahlia Massey, and try to write from that perspective, that will probably spark conversations, very meaningful conversations that will perhaps diffuse it, because now you're looking at it cerebrally, but you're also trying to enter that universe, versus reading it, when you read standard, it's, it, it's horrific, you know, it's, it just comes at you with, with all this data to uh, what you at the time, uh, you have the economic strata, you have the color of your skin, you have all these things playing. 
But I think when you look at something like poetry, and this is what we've been commenting on, people commenting on, when you go at something with poetry, I can put in all the bias I like. I don't have to be clean about it. I don't have to be present a fair, painful. I can say what I want to say. Um, that might, I'm not saying to have a poetry class, but maybe if, if, the, if, the, if the ground for discussion were what is the perspectives of the people playing there, honestly, I wonder if that would diffuse some of that intensity Amen. because there's very little about this that you can go, this boy, you can kind of look at the other side because I can't find it. You, you, you know don't know I mean? it, you don't think it would fuel the rage? When, when Steiner just made me rage, so as far as fueling, like when I had to sit down and write a letter from the perspective, from, from her perspective, perspective, I wrote a letter from the perspective of Dahlia Massey. And Dahlia is the woman that starts all of this. She's the one who puts out the false accusation that she was raped. But in my letter, I have to get into her mindset. If I'm going to write about her, I'm not going to say, I suck, I'm a horrible person, right? <laughs> Nobody thinks of themselves that way. We think we're pretty decent people, you know, and we're going about our lives. So if I'm going to write from her perspective, I have to like kind of get into her. And what I could relate to her was being out of place. She's, she's 19. She's in Hawaii. Her marriage is falling apart. She has no friends. She's not particularly bright. She has no money. She has no, she has no prospects. Her life sucks. The only thing going on for her right now is this trial. That gives her attention. That's kind of, in a strange way, it's solidifying her marriage. Because her husband's sticking around now. Right prior to this, he wants out. He's like, I'm done with this marriage. If I can connect to her, so I, I, I did connect to her on what is it to be the odd man out? What is it to be the one where you wish you could go back in time and just, God, if, if this was just a couple years ago, how much better it would be? When I could relate to her on that level, she became more human. Mm -hmm. And if I had to write about her that way, if I had to relate to her that way, then I had to look at her that way. I still don't like her, but um, that... What I'm saying, when you use that process of humanizing a person, of not looking at them as just a black and white piece of paper, but these are people working off of their own sets of right and wrong, you can at least look at them as humans and kind of look at it as an objective whole versus a, I'm right, you're wrong. These are multifaceted people with multifaceted experiences pushing themselves through the universe as we all are. Plus, I noticed that, you know, whenever, well, when I read Stannard's book, I was like so upset and like I had to put it down for a, a lot of times, like little read it and a little manageable chunk, put it down and all of that. But basically, I, I think and th I think this is universal where when you read something and you, you see the injustice, you know, you just want that injustice to go away, right? You want it to, you want fairness, you want kindness, you want, you want that negative hatred to not be there. So I, I mean, Although there's like anger, um, I think that anger can be used in a productive kind of way where you can make sure that or try to ensure that this kind of stuff doesn't continue, you know, and kind of go the opposite, you know, like I know a lot of people have been doing like peaceful demonstrations, et cetera, you know, but I think the solution is to kind of like what, what Juliet was mentioning earlier about looking at our own selves and our own um, prejudices and our own flaws and then if you know we all do that you know then everything gets a little better you know um so yeah because I mean the, the thing is I notice in history we look at you know people who have been discriminated against people who have been wronged but the thing is they know how it feels to be wronged and and they would never wish anyone to feel that way right so I think you know basically that anger you know, it's not going to, like, you know, I think a lot of people have that sense of responsibility where that anger wouldn't kind of explode. You know, it's like to use that heightened feeling in a more productive, positive way. I, I think that's the, the best solution. And, and um, I think a lot of people have been doing that. So that leads to a lot of fate <laughs> in humanity, basically. Oh, yes. There was a question. Oh, yes, yes, questions. Um, I know you guys connected with the local family of the local boys, um, did you all connect or try to connect with the Matthews as well? Oh, no, no. 
most uh, of them are dead. Dead or yeah, most of them are dead. Uh, Tommy Massey, I think, said if something came out, something came out in nineteen, in the nineteen sixties, and he said if you publish that, I'm going to sue. He was going to sue the author. So you know they kind of held back on publishing certain things. But after he died, I don't. I, even then, the society or the culture here caused everybody to sort of not talk about it. Mm -hmm. It was almost like the Japanese internment where nobody talked about it for many, many years until the younger generations, you know, started talking about it. And it's really weird. When did that, when did that, was it Deacon Jones who confessed to pulling the trigger? Yeah. When did that happen? 66. 60? Yes. Oh, 60s. Yeah. Gave an interview. Did. Yeah. I thought I saw a hand, another hand there. No. no that's a good so. question. Yeah. yeah. Is that it? Okay. Excellent. Shall we say goodbye? <laughs> <laughs> you have another class? We both all have classes. You want a break? <laughs> <laughs> Um, any last questions before we leave? No? All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much well, for seeing well, here. Thank you. Thank you.